And we are live. Welcome everybody to the first BSC News Security Summit. This event is going to be filled with a heavyweight lineup of BSC protocols that are looking to promote and further security. For those who are unaware of the heavyweight lineup we have from Binance Smart Chain, it's gonna consist of these projects. The Binance Smart Chain community, Immunify, SafePal, Hacken, Pancake Bunny, and Onto Wallet. Each speaker has selected a security topic that is a primary focus of their, of their project. The goal of this security summit is to shed light on some of the most important security measures going on and to educate all DeFi users, whether beginner or experienced. Today, I have the pleasure of kicking off the event with Sammy from the Binance Smart Chain community. How's it going, Sammy? All good, Greg, and you? I'm doing great. And if you'd like, you could go ahead and share your screen and then we can jump into your presentation and then get into some discussion once you finish up. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Perfect. Yep, looks like I've got you. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me on. So my name is Sami. I'm one of the uh, BSC ecosystem coordinators. Uh, supporting a number of initiatives and projects in the BSC ecosystem. Uh, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to um, share some highlights of the last one year as we come up to the one year birthday of BSC. Uh, so as uh, many of you may know, we launched the uh, Binance Smart Chain mainnet on the 1st of September, 2020. Um, we've had a really incredible year. Uh, so here's some key data points and highlights I uh, wanted to share with you guys uh, about what we've been able to achieve as a community in the last 12 months. Uh, so we've had very, very significant growth. I think uh, BSC has really driven forward the narrative about a multi-chain future and made that a reality today. Um, so where things stands, we've seen a really huge growth in user base as signaled by total unique active addresses. Today's just shy of 90 million, definitely gonna pass that in the next couple of days. Um, we've, uh, on that point as well, I think we've really seen a, a very large growth in the user base today where BSC is, has the largest user base among any public permission list layer one chain. Um, and many different ways to be able to analyze that data as well. So if you go and look on PancakeSwap, they have by far the largest um, user base among any of the DeFi protocols. And I think several reasons for that. I think uh, transaction fees for sure is one of them. Transaction speed uh, all contribute towards a much better user experience. But I think it's also about ease of access and uh, the DeFi uh, landscape on BSC. Um, which makes it a really easy entry point for new users. And we've seen a massive growth in net new users um, on BSC. In terms of transaction volume, we've just crossed the 1 billion mark. Uh, so today we're about 1,040 uh, uh, 1, million uh, total transactions, and that continues to grow really rapidly. Um, the, on gas fees, we know that's one of the most loved aspects of BSC by the community and users. Uh, so gas fees are denominated in, in BNB, so it's approximately zero point uh, or, 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 or 30 cents. But that changes, of course, as uh, the, the, the price of BNB moves. But generally, I think BSC is uh, uh, targets to be a low fee infrastructure. Um, for DeFi protocols, gaming. It's, a, it's really a, a general purpose blockchain, but for sure the, the DeFi and gaming ecosystems and NFT uh, ecosystems are, are growing really well. In terms of uh, staking, we've also seen a very significant increase uh, and it continues to grow rapidly as well in terms of not only the total amount of BNB staked, which today is just under 15 million BNB staked, which is BNB securing the network through the validator nodes, um, but also really rapid growth in the number of delegators. So it's users and a, a really diverse range of users staking their BNB in validators nodes to help secure the network. So definitely a, a very large community of, of users participating in, in, in staking um, in uh, securing the network. 
Um, we've also seen, of course, and this also continues to grow really rapidly, a very large number of projects and developers that have deployed applications on Binance Smart Chain. Today, the number is above 100, uh, 790, but continues to grow very rapidly. Um, the community as well is large, very engaged, super enthusiastic, and continues to grow really rapidly. Today, we're coming close to a million followers on, on, on Twitter, on the Binance Smart Chain community uh, Twitter, um, as well as very active and vibrant communities on Telegram and Discord and, and, and other channels as well. Um, so you can see from these metrics that B the BSC community is, is grown rapidly and continues to continues to grow over the last 12 months. It's been really exciting what's happened so far, but we also can, we're also super excited about what, 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 what's coming up. The exponential growth has been insane. It has been fantastic to watch, and we're, we're super excited to continue that as well. Definitely. Um, coming to the topic uh, while we're here, so security um, is a key priority that we, we want to encourage in a number of different ways. Um, so security, I think it's really important. We've had, obviously, a number of um, it, uh, exploits and uh, security incidents on, on, on BSC, but of course these are not unique to BSC. Um, they've happened, we've seen a lot of these events happening, but it's driven by a number of facts. One is that there is a large DeFi ecosystem there with very high TVL in a lot of the DeFi protocols, and as well a very, very large number of new users. So driving security best practices and a security mindset is a really key priority for the whole ecosystem and community. There's a number of initiatives that we've um, uh, developed as the community to, to, to drive forward the security agenda for the BSC community. We've launched um, an initiative called Priority One. So Priority One includes a number of things. So it's uh, primarily a $10 million bounty program. So it's a matching uh, bug bounty program to in encourage and further incentivize projects in the BSC ecosystem to uh, to to uh, put out bug bounty programs of their own. Uh, so security audits are, are super important. We'll definitely talk a lot more about that. But I think bug bounty programs also have uh, equal importance there. So it encourages the community of developers as well as white hats to really scrutinize uh, contract suites and applications to identify and address potential vulnerabilities. Uh, so we have, uh, we're targeting to get over a hundred dApps uh, enrolled in this initiative. And the idea is to, uh, the objective is really to improve significantly security of the, the BSC ecosystem. Alongside that, we have a number of other initiatives under the uh, uh, priority one umbrella. So we have a strategic cooperation with PeckShield, and we also encourage the security community, the broader security community within crypto to also participate here. Uh, but we have a very strong and appreciated cooperation with PeckShield um, and value their partnership in the BSC ecosystem and community highly. We've also launched Crypto Safe Alliance. It's a uh, industry um, uh, industry alliance that's aimed at strengthening security and uh, uh, strengthening security, implementing and sharing best practices to prevent exploits and um, uh, hacks that are happening that 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 may happen. Uh, we also have a very strong cooperation with Certic. Um, also highly value their, um, their support on the security fund front to the BSC community. Uh, so Certix providing security oracles, uh, security auditing services, as well as the Certix Shield, among other services. We're also doing a lot and will continue uh, to do more on the educational side. So running hackathons and workshops and, and events like this one. So to, to, to summarize here, security is really a, a, the number one priority uh, and will continue to be the number one priority for the BSE ecosystem. We really want to reiterate the uh, importance of this and, and all of these in, in, initiatives uh, are very strong signals around um, our perspective of the prioritization of security to the BSE developer community. 
Definitely. Um, it's really amazing to kind of see you guys jump on board and work with all of these security firms to kind of further the goal of Binance Smart Chain, especially with kind of the increase in exploits. It's nice seeing that we, you guys are sort of trying to bolster this idea of making security a top priority and making sure everyone is on the same page with these sorts of things. It's definitely super important. I mean, I think there's been a lot of uh, disc discourse on Twitter and other places about um, um, exploits and other things like that on BSC, but I definitely want to reiterate that that these types of exploits are not unique to BSC, right? It, it, yeah. it has become a target for the individuals uh, behind these types of exploits, primarily driven by a large number of new users. You know, new users are um, have, have a really steep learning curve, um, as with anybody coming into crypto, but they're also uh, prone to 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 exploits. It's not only new users. Every every like a lot of users get get caught up in 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 um, uh, exploits of these types of incidents. But we really want to create a strong community of security partners, uh, such as the, the the partners that you see here uh, on the screen. And we encourage more participation from the broader crypto ecosystem and key security experts there. Definitely. Uh, so we talked a little bit about um, the achievements in the last 12 months, but I also wanted to share some perspectives on, on some of the focus areas for uh, what's coming up. Um, there's a number of initiatives that we're rolling out. So the Most Valuable Builder program, we just launched MVB3, um, and we have a number of themes there as well that are well aligned to the, the, the key focus areas in terms of BSC roadmap uh, for, the coming, for the coming months. Uh, one of the key things is really strengthening critical infrastructure and services on, on BSC. So um, we've seen uh, all-time high transaction volumes, number of times we had one recently as well in the middle of last month, where we see very high loads on uh, uh, node, R R RPC nodes, APIs, and uh, all of the ancillary infrastructure. So we we have a a big focus on strengthening the critical infrastructure that's going to be able to support the development and scaling of large scale uh, use cases and, and projects. Um, so this is a key focus area. We, we're, we're working closely with uh, enterprise grade providers to provide high performance nodes, uh, improve the developer tooling and developer experience as well as improve cross-chain infrastructure and infrastructure will, that will support, support the bridging of CFI and, and DeFi. Um, we're also looking at supporting um, and strengthening the DeFi landscape and infrastructure to support uh, emerging use cases, especially in, in the area of institutional DeFi, which has its own set of unique requirements such as Transaction privacy, uh, permission, uh, uh, permission lending pools, and and a whole number of different types of requirements that are required to uh, enable the growth of institutional DeFi on on BSC, um, as well as real world uh, asset use cases. So I think there is a number of areas, both from the infrastructure as well as tooling perspective, that we're looking to. Uh, help foster to uh, be deployed on BSC to help grow these areas. We're also looking at supporting um, use cases that are driving mass adoption. So I think at, uh, from the perspective of BSC, that's one area that BSC has been able to achieve quite successfully is supporting the development of use cases and domains that drive mass adoption. And that's really what we want to, to, to enable is bring more users into crypto and make it a safe and equitable um, um, environment for users globally from all, 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 all backgrounds. Um, another key area we're really focusing on is uh, supporting the developer community. So the, the, the BSC developer community, we want to ensure they have an exceptional developer experience and be able to support them in building out innovative new um, uh, DeFi as well as gaming, NFT, uh, and other uh, uh, projects on the BSC infrastructure. So 
So that's a little bit of information I wanted to share on terms of what's coming up, as well as share some perspective on 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 where what what we've been able to achieve as a community in the in the last few months. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sammy. There's a ton of insight there, and I think kind of one of the crucial things is just how fast Binance Smart Chain has grown and. Now it's really apparent that all of these kind of security focuses and incentives need to be brought to the chain. And that's exactly what we're kind of, everyone as a whole is building here on Binance Smart Chain. And kind of just to get into some discussion here, we have close to a thousand dApps now. How does Binance Smart Chain community go about working with certain projects and kind of trying to pick out the best and most quality teams with good smart contracts? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the community continues to grow really fast. And um, I think there's a number of different, there's some really great resources available for teams at different stages. So either really early teams or teams that are uh, already deployed and starting their jo journey on uh, user acquisition and growth. Um, so I think there's different types of resources available, uh, great, great resources available for teams at different stages. Uh, but in, team, in, in terms of the, the uh, uh, core BSC coordinator team, we're really trying to support teams that have great um, uh, execution capabilities on the product development, as well as great execution capabilities on user acquisition, and teams that have some gaps or, let's say, uh, weaknesses in, in particular areas, we'll try to advise them on ways to kind of fill those gaps and, um, and be able to... Uh, with the initial deployments, try to understand any infrastructure requirements or tooling requirements and cater for those. And then once they're uh, launched and um, start, um, uh, and once they go live, uh, advise them on strategies around growth and user acquisition. Uh, so we're doing a number of things around that area, but a, a key aspect there is also um, support and advice around security best practices. Uh, about uh, and there's a number of things there. So it's also getting the developer communities and project teams to get uh, to to start thinking um, about or start thinking differently about security audits. Uh, so a lot of we see a lot of one of the common things is we'll see a lot of project teams that think uh, it, it's good or good enough to do a, a security audit one time at the time that right before they go launch or soon after they launch. Mm -hmm. But we really want to change that mindset a lot. We, uh, we think like security audits should be a, an ongoing thing. Um, so as all products and all projects have a product development roadmap, as they progress along that product development roadmap, they need to be thinking about security auditing um, really as a, a, a in a more continuous uh, in a more continuous fashion. Um, yeah, alongside that as well, it's also important I think to have uh, more than one audit and more by more than one auditor. Uh, it's getting more eyes, more expert eyes on the code and trying to uh, try to find vulnerabilities. I feel like this is kind of where the priority one event comes in. And it's not specifically audits, but it's kind of this idea of not just reactive kind of security measures, but being proactive and jumping on these sorts of things. What made you guys choose the specific partners to help you guys carry out these like almost strengthening security on Binance Smart Chain? So I think a number of things. We want to, uh, the, we, we are working with uh, the most reputable and most capable firms in the security space. Uh, firms like PeckShield and, um, and Certic amongst, uh, amongst many others. Um, so we, we, we want to reinforce this message about a security first approach to development. And I think it's not only about the, the, the smart contract suites and code, it's also getting the, those teams thinking about operational security of how the teams operate. How are they securing their own keys and treasuries and those kind of things? How are they preparing uh, for any kind of incidents? Uh, having a plan in place. Obviously, the, uh, we hope that none of the teams have to put those plans in place, but. Uh, having a plan is much better than not, right? So I think it's also about getting them to think about worst case scenarios and uh, and planning for those, and also thinking about other aspects, about the communities, about um, 
bot attacks that might happen in telegram groups and all kinds of other things that happen outside of just the core code on on on, on their platforms so from that perspective we're really looking at engage and we are engaging with and um, leveraging the expertise of the the most experienced and capable um, security partners in, in, in the in the ecosystem yeah it sounds like you guys are really trying to leverage the community and bring together this idea of kind of holistic security on Binance Smart Chain. Um, are these same sort of tools available to MVB projects? And how is, it's pretty similar, but how how is the vetting process and security measures behind those? Because I know MVB projects are very heavily regarded by the community um, and even Binance Smart Chain. Yeah, for sure. So I think the MVP is really great in a number of ways because it helps to um, the, just the structure of how MVP is designed. It kind of um, prioritizes support for uh, projects with the largest and fastest growing communities um, and also the, the projects that are have the best delivery and execution capabilities. So, so, so there we do incorporate uh, security standards and the vetting process uh, really vigorously in the selection process for all of the projects. Uh, so security audits, bug bounty programs are, are, are not nice to have, they're must-haves for, for the, the participants, especially the projects that are aspiring to be winners in the MVP3. Um, we, we're really working closely with them to to share our perspective around security best practices and try to uh, incorporate those in, those in in their development practices uh, and as part of the development culture in, in, in those in those teams. Uh, so we're leveraging the security partners uh, that, that I mentioned, but we're also doing conducting our own technical and security due diligence on, on, on these projects. Perfect. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And thank you so much, Sammy. We're going to start to wrap this up here just because we have this jam-packed lineup. But I think it's incredibly notable all the different programs Binance Smart Chain has going on for security and for projects that are building. I think it was notable how you mentioned that there's sort of stages where projects can go to different resources that you guys are providing to build. Um, I gained a ton of insight on security from this presentation and the discussion, and I'm sure the community has as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Sammy. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Definitely. Speak soon. Perfect. We're now going to go ahead and jump into our first project. So this project is a leading crypto asset management platform. They're actually backed by Binance, and I'm referring to the SafePal wallet. They have over 2.5 million users that use their app, and they'll be joining us to discuss the core components of what makes SafePal or why SafePal grants a secure DeFi experience. Specifically, their products focus on physical products. Um, notably, they have an S1 hardware wallet. Today, Tyler, head of growth at SafePal, will be joining us to discuss SafePal's security focus. How's it going, Tyler? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep, you might be a little quiet on my end. Okay, is it, is it better now? Yep, sounds good for me. Nice to have you on again. Yeah, it's a pleasure to come on. I think I was here just a few weeks ago, right, with, with the announcement of MoonPot. Yep, we were, do, we were talking about the wallet, holding, wallet holder offering. And anyone who tuned into that stream is probably fairly excited with the success of MoonPot and the Who. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the results were, were are definitely tremendous, right, right now. Um, I think most of our community, especially those that participated, are, are super satisfied with the results. Definitely. So you could actually go ahead and share your screen, and then we can jump into your presentation and get into SafePal's security foci. Okay, yeah. Let me know if you're having any issues there, but should be pretty smooth. Yeah, can you see the screen now? Yep. Yeah, I think this is fine, right? Yeah, potentially just jump into the present in the top right. I think it'll full screen it for you. Okay. There we go. Is it better? Yep, all set. Yeah, so 
let me just talk a bit more about SafePal, um, given that this is definitely about security and uh, user asset protection. Perfect. So SafePal is a company, well, we're specifically a wallet platform company that offers software and hardware wallet solution, right? We've been, we were founded as shown in 2018. Basically, we manage crypto asset for users. And right now we support over 23 blockchains. And actually, we're getting ready to add another one really, really quickly, right? Um, by the end of this week, that's our timeline. But, you know, we've encountered a lot of issues with, with the recent uh, Ethereum London hard fork that we're trying to just scramble to add support for, which is causing a bit of delay. But we are expecting to have another new blockchain onto the platform really soon. And right now, the entire mission here at SafePal is definitely our number one priority is to protect users' assets, right? And given the fact that we support and we have over 2.5 million app downloads, we're seeing about 1.25 million monthly active users. And there's just a lot of users that are now engaged in the crypto world, right? And they're looking for solutions that SafePal can offer. So here is a presentation in terms of the products that we offer, right? As mentioned, we have a hardware wallet, right? We're one of the most value priced hardware wallets and it's completely offline with an air gap, air gap signing mechanism, which allows you to stay 100% offline and it's paired with your mobile device. So you can engage with the crypto world. And I'm sure right now everyone's super excited with what's happening in the DeFi space, right? When we first began supporting it about a year ago, you know, the space wasn't that big, but now DeFi is like a $2 trillion market, right? So there's a lot of users that are looking for a safe way to interact with this space, right? And a hardware wallet, specifically the one that we have, is definitely the most secure way for you to participate. And as well as the in-app, I think most users that use our product understand that we have in-app DApp support, right? So today I really wanna talk about ways in order for users to protect themselves while engaging in the crypto space. So that's why these are some of the products that we have, and these are the solutions that we offer for users for them to safely and securely participate in the crypto space. The hardware wallet is obviously the most secure way for you to interact and sign transactions, right? And then the other one is that, you know, we come across a lot of users that create wallets, you know, whether they're participating in our airdrops, whether, you know, they're just coming on, giving our product a try, but there's a lot of users that they tend to forget, lose, right? And they just don't bother creating a C phrase. And this is a huge problem that, you know, we experience on a daily basis because we're a decentralized platform. Like it's really important that the users keep track of their C phrases themselves. We at SafePal, we don't have some kind of database. We're not storing your data, especially your C phrase. So this is something that you need to learn to protect, right? Which is why we also have solutions like the SafePal Cypher where users can, you know, after they create their uh, C phrase after the wallet generates this for them, they need to keep it safe and write it down somewhere. But you know, a piece of paper isn't just going to do it. So ideally you would want to store it on something like this, where it's flame, flame proof, right? Anti-corrosive, et cetera. This is going to last much longer than your piece of paper. That's now, definitely, that, sorry, just to jump in here. I have just something funny. That's one of like the biggest things I've shown people crypto and started to set up wallets. And one of the first things they go to do is screenshot their screen, their seed phrase. And I'm like, nope, I'm not going to show you if you're going to be lazy and not write this down. Like these, these are some of the most easy and crucial things. And you're going to regret it if you don't do things like writing down a seed phrase and then even just ordering a hardware wallet. Just wanted to jump in there, throw that out there. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Like it's great to have your input because you know, these things happen. It happens more often than people think, right? And I understand out of convenience at the moment, you may not want to write it down, but it's this, you know, this comfort, I guess, is ultimately going to put your assets at risk. So this is why we highly advise users, when you make your wallet, make sure you give yourself enough time 
where you can write down these seed phrases somewhere safe and store it safely. And preferably, I honestly recommend get something like a safe house cipher so you can put it in there, right? And it's not on a piece of paper where you're, you're likely it gets damaged, destroyed, lost, or it becomes unreadable for whatever reason, right? Now, going back to this hardware wallet, right? So within DeFi, one of the things or the huge trend change here in crypto is that given the fast pace or the fast paced growth of DeFi, a lot of people engage in crypto now in a completely different way compared to just two years ago or even three years ago. You know, a couple of years ago, everything was on a centralized platform. So in order to participate in crypto, you had to take part in a centralized solution. Now, with the emergence of DeFi, you know, with DEXs like Uniswap, Pancake Swap, right, Sushi Swap, ultimately everything's becoming more decentralized. So has the wallet, right? You are now held responsible and you're given full control of your financials, right? Especially your crypto assets. So you need to be able to, or you would like to keep it safe and interact with the space in the safest way possible. Ultimately, going back, you want to get a hardware wallet just so that you as an individual keep your assets on a decentralized environment so that the, the app or the project, right, or the product or service that you're engaged with in the crypto space, if they have some kind of service outage, for example, their servers crash, or if, if the centralized wallet that you decide to use, you know, um, they're storing your personal data, right? Ultimately, that's not, you know, those funds are not, they don't belong to you, right? So this is why ideally the best way is to store it in a hardware wallet. And SafePals and our product makes it a whole lot easier given the fact that, you know, we totally understand that users now want convenience. They want simplicity and convenience. So the S1 is designed in a way that you carry it with you. And whenever you want to make a transaction, you simply have to just take it out and sign it. You don't need to carry cables around with you. you. You just charge the device. And every time you want to make a transaction, it's light enough and it's small enough for you to be able to carry it on the go, right? And allow you to sign any transaction at any time. Now, I do know that, you know, some users are worried about, well, what if I lose my hardware wallet, right, on the go? What if my hardware wallet gets damaged? What if someone steals it from me? Well, we've had surprise audit teams try to crack the device, even given physical access. Our device is designed with mechanisms that will shut it off after five, five failed attempts, right? So even with surprise audits by, you know, there's world-class audit teams out there that have tried to take try to take a shot at the SafePal S1 hardware wallet, but they weren't able to break into it to get what's important, which is ultimately your funds and your seed phrase. So this is why, given the fact that as long as you have your seed phrase, you can always recover your access or your, your assets. Now, I think the next point I wanna talk about would be just some of the, some of the uh, issues that we come across on a daily basis so that users can learn how to keep their assets safe and how to safely participate within the um, crypto industry. So now I wanna talk about something called wallet security for DeFi users, right? So I think the best way for individuals to learn is to look at case studies, right? Or mistakes that, or common mistakes that people make. Now here we have three issues and ultimately it's the same issue. So because DeFi, you know, it, it's still, I would say it's still quite early within the DeFi space. And whether you're a beginner or whether you're someone, you know, like a, a veteran who's been in the space for, for, for quite, a, quite a while, sometimes there's a lot of people that aren't able to read things at a code level, right? There's a lot of users that aren't really that deep. So when they participate in a lot of the dApps that, you know, they, they get interested in, 
they're not really sure what they're signing access to. So the first time you actually engage with a DeFi project, and especially if you have a wallet account where, where you try out everything, right? You're like a savvy person and, and, and you want to be a part of as many crypto opportunities as you can. So you're going around signing your wallet onto, you know, every dApp you have an interest in. And ultimately, because you, you aren't really reading that deep into the code level to understand what kind of dApp you just gave authorization to, some of these could be malicious. Right, which is why we're looking at three different cases of individuals that have lost all their funds. Right, I mean, we we we've come across, you know, individuals in this with three to five years experience, and and they've still, you know, lost everything. Basically, some of these malicious DApps that you're giving authorization to, because the moment you sign for your wallet to participate or to get access to the DAP, you're giving full access of your funds to the DAP, right? To the DAP and the, the services that they're going to provide to you, whether it's swap services, whether it's some kind of NFT service, whether it's some kind of liquidity pool that they're incentivizing you or it's a lending protocol, because there's so many malicious players out there, you know, when you do that without that knowledge, what ends up happening is, most of the time it's set at default to unlimited so you're giving that dap unlimited access to your funds it essentially can withdraw as much as it wants so this is so here you're seeing three cases of this now specifically we know that these three cases are caused by one of the most uh, a i would just say a frequent a frequent a frequent situation right now which is there's a lot of scam projects that are you know sending out scam tokens via an airdrop mechanism they're sending this out to the community and you're going to sometimes see it in your wallet this used to occur on ethereum when ethereum gas fees were really low you know a lot of malicious individuals were creating tokens with this intention but now you know on the BSC side, right, there's a lot of activity happening on BSC. And now these scammers have shifted and started targeting not just on BSC, but all across different networks, right? So they're dropping these tokens into individuals' wallets. They're finding your wallet addresses through just BSC scan, Ethereum scan, or just the scan explorers. And they're just loading your wallets up with these different coins. So, you know, we've come across a lot of issues where, where individuals are asking us, what's this token? How did I get it? Well, you know, your address is public. Um, it's just that they don't know your identity, but it, everything on the blockchain is technically public. So they're able to pull this up and send you airdrops of these tokens. And because you become curious, you suddenly get a thousand, a million or a hundred thousand of these coins. And that curiosity ends up leading you to some kind of malicious place where you where they're requesting you to sign some kind of transaction to pretty much liquidate these coins that they gave you so that you can sell it onto the market and, and get a profit. But it's essentially a scam because the moment you sign authorization, you've given full access, right? And now these scammers have now full access to your funds. And this is exactly what's happening. Like, as you can see, these are dated, right? All throughout this month, last month, right and and even today you know these things are happening so we at safe power are definitely looking at ways to uh, improve this while staying true to our decentralized mission right it, it would make it doesn't make any sense for us to just outright block out transaction right like that's not what a decentralized wallet should even be doing so we're definitely looking at ways to improve so some of the solutions that we've already created would be right now if you use the wallet you've probably come across security quizzes right and just in the last few weeks we've made a lot of public announcements educating users because i think the biggest challenge with in the space is definitely user education and then with regards to the whole airdrop mechanism is that all the um ones that safepal officially uh i would say back come from the safepal wallet holder offering right anything else it has it does not involve us right so there's a lot of projects out there that may be using our name using our platform to um 
provide tokens. But as if you don't see it as part of the SafePal wallet holder offering, then these type of airdrops are definitely not related to us, right? The whole point of why we created the whole WHO mechanism was to improve upon the airdrop process because there's a lot of issues plagued with its design. Perfect. Yeah. And no, specifically when kind of interacting with these new projects, something I do is I just make a brand new wallet. If this is something where it's a project that is just released and I don't want to give them um, allowances to one of my main wallets, I'll just load up a new wallet and transfer a minimal amount of funds that I'm willing to risk on the protocol. So that's something I kind of take as a measure to if I am interacting with, because I love kind of just jumping on all of these new projects. So when I do interact with something that looks a little bit more risky or is new to the market, I definitely just open up a new wallet. That way, if I do give any malicious um, allowances, I'm only risking what I know I wanted to risk. Yeah, like definitely, right? I think that's definitely one of the ways that, you know, we've been telling users, if you're going to engage in something brand new, um, you don't understand how risky this thing is, definitely set limit or create a separate wallet where it has a limited amount of funds, right? Don't use your your main portfolio to jump into, you know, some of the um, high risk or the ones that just, it just came out. There's no audit reports on it. You know, nobody really knows anything about it. You think it's a great opportunity, right? Go ahead, give it a shot. But, you know, do keep, do set certain risk management strategies in place, right? And I think that's actually a great thing, right? This is definitely something that we advocate, you know, place, create a new wallet and then just set a small amount. Perfect. And then just another thing there, if you guys do have allowances, maybe you interacted with something you think is potentially malicious, there are various allowance checkers across the BSC. One I know notably is Beefy Finance has an allowance checker that'll let you re revoke any permissions from certain contracts. Yeah, definitely, definitely, right? There's, you, you know, even when we, um, within the SafePal wallet, we've got an in-app DAP, DAP store where users can engage with any DAP that has come to, um, you know, publicate their information to us and make a submission to our community, right? And then once we offer support, because we obviously first have to test that this DAP actually has built in a wallet integration system so that our users can connect properly, right? And then once that's done, then we would, you know, list it onto the, um, the SafePal in-app in DAP store. And the moment you sign into it, it actually allows you to set limits, right? So this is why I, I personally would, you know, I, I advocate that users do set certain limits, right? And there's, yes, like you mentioned, there's definitely also now there are toolkits that allows you to revoke all the past contracts. So if you don't know what you signed or you did this you, a few months ago and you're not sure all the different dApps that you've given authorizations to, there are ways we've created guides for users to come and pretty much revoke all of those, right? And then start anew. Perfect. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys got it figured out with the permissions. And that's kind of a main thing there. That's pretty much like making a new wallet if you just limit it, the permission to what you wanted to risk. Yeah, definitely. Right. And then we're also, you know, we're always looking at ways to improve security, right? That's definitely our number one priority. So we've already been working on designs um, like the SafePal gift box, earn, and also displaying third party infos on tokens, right? Yeah. And just to get into a little bit dis of discussion, did you have any other slides or anything you wanted to touch on, Tyler, before I jump into a couple questions? Um, no, I think this is essentially um, what we've had time to prepare, right? And what, Perfect. We, what we're able to share. Perfect. So the most notable product is obviously the S1 hardware wallet. How can, I know these are like a hot commodity at the moment. How can users go about getting a SafePal S1 wallet? Um, right now, I would definitely advise users to visit our official website, right? SafePal.io, and you can purchase one directly. And within our website, we also have a resellers tab where you can find a domestic or an official domestic reseller that we would support and, and see if they have inventory. Right. However, right now, you know, due to the extreme demand, um, we are expected to run out of products really, really quickly. 
Definitely. Yeah. I know BSC News team is trying to actually get some safe pal wallets and we know there's been issues with demand. So just wanted to kind of surface that and point community members in the right direction. You also noticed, uh, mentioned that uh, SafePal has sort of this in-app, uh, D-app integration. How do you guys go about adding projects and doing any vetting or security measures before adding these projects into the wallet? Um, so on this side, if a project would like to, you know, be listed towards our users, they just go to our website. There's a submit a token and submit a DAP option for the community or the projects themselves, and they can make an application. And the thing about vetting is that, you know, we don't really have the resources to fully vet everything that gets submitted. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you know, what we do is we just test to see if the wallet connection actually exists, right? It, 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 there's no benefit if a project doesn't even support a connection for the SafePal wallet, right? So this is why we generally drive them or drive the projects that way to actually build it. And our engineers simply just test that, right? However, we are looking at different ways in terms of how we can, you know, improve the security aspect on some of the dApps that are supported. Perfect. Yeah. So currently it sounds like that is definitely, it's a great tool. It's just important that users do know that it's the same thing as all decentralized finance. They need to exercise cautious caution when interacting with these projects. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and if any project is looking to collaborate with us, um, this is when we would have mandatory requests on audits, right? Um, you know, we don't do these audits, but they have to go out there and, and get themselves audited, right? Contracts, you know, if they have smart contracts that need to be audited, token contracts that need to be audited, right? Before we're willing to jump in. Perfect. Yeah. And kind of just to wrap this one up here, how essential would you say a hardware wallet is for a beginner and kind of ensuring DeFi security? Sort of just to wrap up everything we've gone over. Yeah, so I think definitely a hardware wallet, to be honest, I would say it's the first step, right? If you're going to engage in this DeFi space nowadays, everything or your, your entire user journey experience begins with a wallet. So you ideally, if you're going to go in with, let's say, $100 worth of investment, you ideally want to make sure that you have at least the basics or or one of the most secure ways to securely securely store your crypto assets right and and it definitely begins with a hardware wallet right these and we have one of those most value priced products with everything you're going to need right from the moment you need to on-ramp fiat uh we are partnered with really credible third-party sources like simplex and btc direct right to the moment that you need to trade if you need to trade we have swap features we've got the binance dap built inside right and ultimately, if you want to engage with the more advanced stuff that exists within DeFi, we support pretty much everything out there that exists currently across the 23 blockchains that we do support, right, within our dApp store. And we're looking to constantly add more, right? And I want to throw in one last bit, which is why wouldn't you get a hardware wallet that would reward you, right? I'm sure we know what we're talking about with regards to the whole wallet holder offering. Definitely. So... That was a great presentation and discussion, Tyler. And on the part of earning with the wallet, the who definitely for Moonpot made a great case on, not even on the security side, but just on potential upside of using SafePal's products. So not only does this provide security features, there's utility behind it as well. And I think the really important thing is there's really a breakthrough on sort of the value users get for this hardware wallet. Before it used to be something where, oh, this hardware wallet's kind of expensive. I'd rather just use it more as an investment. But now with something like the SafePal S1, it's very efficient to jump in um, with a hardware wallet and protect your investment. Yeah, definitely, right? We're always looking at ways to improve that user, new user on-ramp, right? To improve the user experience journey. A hundred percent. Thank you so much, Tyler, for the discussion. Um, I look forward to speaking with you in the future. And thanks for sharing everything on SafePal's security foci. Thanks for having me, Greg. Definitely. Pleasure to be here.
Perfect. Our next project prioritizes ongoing due diligence checks and audits. This is extremely important and been one of the rising topics on across all DeFi networks. This platform is popularizing the use of bug bounties in DeFi and incentivizing community white hat community members to become white hats. The project I'm referring to is Immunify, and they conduct the largest bug bounties across DeFi. There are currently over 100 bug bounties with over $25 million in rewards. And in essence, Immunify is incentivizing black hats to report to directly to projects and fix mistakes while still earning rewards without the inclusion of crime. But enough of my chatter. Today we have Duncan Townsend, the chief security officer from Immunify, and he will touch on the expansive bug bounty Immunify has formulated on Binance Smart Chain. How's it going, Duncan? It's going great. Thanks. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. You could go ahead and jump on with your screen and then dive into your presentation. I'm excited to see what you guys got. Yeah, so <clears throat> Immunify is a bug bounty platform securing the largest projects across DeFi. Uh, we are essentially your last bastion of defense against the black hat hacker. By listing a bug bounty program with Immunify, um, BSC projects are telling their communities, here's the value of your security, and we're backing it with our own money, right? When a, if, a, if a bug comes in that you know, could result in loss of funds, right? It's the economic incentives of that bug bounty that makes the hacker decide, you know what? It's actually worth it to me to report this to the project than it is to exploit it, you know, because that's clean money, because, you know, there's no laundering, the police aren't going to come after you. It turns black hats white, and it saves projects money, uh, or rather I should say it saves the users their money. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking for what makes a project legitimate, having a bug bounty program with Immunify is one of the big indicators that a project takes security seriously. Um, we, uh, a couple of presentations ago, we were talking about uh, holistic operational security, and that's also a thing that's really important because there's this intense trade-off between the agility of a project to be able to respond to a security threat and the ability of that project to rug pull, right? You know, the more agile a project has, the more centralized it is, the easier it is for it to respond, but also the more you have to trust that project not to pull the rug. Let's talk about Immunify's progress um, towards bringing bug bounties to DeFi. Bug bounties, of course, are a big thing in centralized security. Um, but to make them work for DeFi requires a bit of change here. Um, there's a famous quote, which I apologize, I can't remember the, the originator of, but uh, every cryptocurrency project is just a bug bounty in disguise, right? Because if you can hack that project, you can take their money. And by having that be an informal bug bounty, and uh, you're exposing your users to the risk that hackers are going to take their money. When you post a formal bug bounty, Right, that's a negotiation between the project and a hacker, be they a black hat or a white hat. So uh, a year ago, there were no bug bounty programs on BSC. Uh, we nobody knew how to run a bug bounty program that made sense for DeFi. You know, you have uh, lots of money at risk, and you have uh, an interesting set of priorities for DeFi projects. Projects don't necessarily care about things like uh, you know leaking PII like you do in the centralized security world, because there is no PII, right? Everyone is anonymous. You also don't know how to track the right kind of talent, right? Talent in DeFi for security or development or anything like that is incredibly expensive. And so you have to tilt those tables to make it make sense for those really high skilled hackers, be they black hats or white hats, to take a look at your projects. And then, you know, pricing the vulnerabilities is a hard thing as well. You're not sure whether the vulnerability that you're bringing to the table, you know, has real impact. And if it does have real impact, you know, what percentage of that vulnerability makes sense to pay out? So Immunify has uh, standardized on 10% uh, of the total value at risk. That's really the number where black hats start to perk up and take pay attention. Um, of course, you know, you go above that, you get more black hats, you get more surety that you're not going to get hacked, but it becomes more expensive. And then, you know, lastly, what's the what's the equivalent of CVE for um, for DeFi, right? You have the SWC registry, um, but that's slow to update. And you're getting these radically changing uh, 
uh, attack patterns that you have to be constantly on top of. And a project doesn't necessarily have that uh, the um, the bandwidth to keep track of all of that. And that's where Immunify comes in. You know, we in-house a lot of that security expertise, provide it on a consulting basis, you know, look at those reports, prioritize the ones that are actually important. As far as our partnership with BSC, um, as you can see from my slide, we're bringing bug bounties to BSC, we're onboarding BSC projects, we're making sure they're secure, uh, and we've proven that the scaling bug bounty standard works. Uh, in PancakeSwap, we disclosed and PancakeSwap fixed no fewer than three critical vulnerabilities, including one that uh, total funds at risk were over a million dollars. Um, these are the ways that Immunify is keeping BSC safe. And just to jump in here, what kind of is the idea behind the scaling bug bounty standard? So the idea is, you know, if you show me that you can steal $10 million, rather than you stealing that $10 million, I'm going to give you 1 million free and clear. And then Perfect. I'm going to fix the bug. Yeah. And so that that's kind of that 10% number you were mentioning where the other 90% that the black hat could get is not worth going through all the kind of criminal troubles is what this standard is kind of finding. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, we have real proof of that, you know, unfortunately I can't give you the details, but I know for certain that a lot of the hackers who look for bugs on Immunify, their main job is black hat hacking. It's just that the bounties that are offered uh, by BSC projects through Immunify are so large, it makes sense to them. And you can take a look at the recent Thorchain hack. The uh, Thorchain hacker released a public statement that if Thorchain had offered him a 10% bug bounty, he would not have hacked them. Yeah, that's incredible. It's amazing that you guys are kind of setting up this infrastructure and fill, finding out these things, how to efficiently get proactive sort of audits going on. And it really is, uh, to some extent, an ongoing audit, right? Immunify is not a replacement for audits. You want to make sure that you've audited your code before you list a bug bounty program. But after you've done that audit, after you've gone on mainnet, Immunify is your last bastion of defense against getting hacked. Makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about the Priority One program. So because BSC is committed to security and keeping all of the dApps on BSC secure, uh, BSC has launched in conjunction with Immunify, the Priority One Bug Bounty Matching Program. So for large projects on BSC that are listing bug bounties that have met certain other security criteria, uh, there is this bug bounty matching program where BSC is providing some of the funds to keep that project secure. And that really demonstrates the seriousness with which the BSC is taking security and making sure that the, pro the projects on BSC have best in class security. Definitely. And you can see the details here. You know, the expectation is that we're going to, using these BNB matching funds, keep projects secure to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Perfect. And this event is like close to 10 million, correct? And how much is being deployed? 30,000 BNB, if I'm doing my math correct there. Uh, mental math is not my strong suit, but yes, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I wasn't even doing the math. I think that's just a number I've seen before in one of our articles. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. so this, yeah, this go is, ahead. Sorry, please continue. Oh, no, go ahead. I didn't have much. Just let me know once you're kind of wrapping up and then we can jump into dis some discussion. So I'll let you close this out. Yeah, so I think I, I think I have only one more slide here. Perfect. Uh, so the the point here is that the bug bounty process is integral to DeFi, right? Like I said, every crypto project is a bug bounty in disguise. We need, we need to make that, rather than being a, in disguise, it needs to be a real bug bounty program to keep those user funds secure. Um, and Immunify is coming up with financial products to make that make sense for projects. Um, you know, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll have big announcements in the future. The BSC Priority One Bug Bounty Matching Program is absolutely the future of bug bounties in DeFi, keeping things secure, making sure that um, when bugs are found, they don't get exploited, they get fixed. And then of course, um, the financial incentives there are 
giving white hats the um, the impetus, the incentive to upskill, to outpace those black hats, to make sure that the bad guys are better, sorry, the good guys are better than the bad guys, um, and they keep those projects secure, the bugs get found and fixed before they can get exploited. Definitely. And it really seems like Immunify has stepped up and filled this void on Binance Smart Chain. Are there, there's not too many other um, firms doing bug bounties to this size now? No, making bug bounties work for DeFi is Immunify's area of expertise. And it's, it's something that we've developed a deep expertise on um, that our competitors are struggling to match. Definitely. How did you guys sort of get projects to not really buy in because it's a security function, but how did you get them to jump on board with this idea? I imagine once the results started kind of coming in that it was a little bit easier. Yeah. So the, the thing with bug bounties is they make total financial sense for the project and for the hacker, right? There's no upfront cost to the project to launching a bug bounty program. With Immunify, you know, we work strictly on a, um, a commission basis. Uh, we don't take a upfront cost. We may, we create and manage your bug bounty program only for the value that we deliver in preventing hacks. Um, so that really, uh, eases the onboarding process. It makes it a really easy value proposition for the project. And then of course, on the other side for the hacker, it makes sense because you're getting a cut of whatever it is that you save. That makes a ton of sense. And so obviously you mentioned that Immunify wasn't the first to kind of think about this bug bounty idea. This has been a thing for a long time in centralized solutions. Do bug bounties get as large as they're getting on Immunify outside of the space? Or are you guys beginning to break away and have something truly unique here? We have the biggest bug bounties anywhere. Um, you know, because the amount of money in DeFi is is the biggest, um, and the uh, the DeFi community takes security way more seriously um, than centralized finance. There was a, a really excellent uh, bug report that I read recently about using um, HTTP smuggling to steal PII from Verizon. You know, one of the largest telecom companies in the United States, mm -hmm. and the hacker was paid less than twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, you know, that's not <laughs> right. On Immunify, you know, that's you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars for that bug report, because that's how much security matters in DeFi. Yeah, that's massive. And just to pick out a more specific example directly here on the Binance Smart Chain, you you mentioned you the bug bounty for Pancake Swap found some critical bugs. What was sort of the process behind that behind this? How how did the report process come and how long did it take to sort of patch this and get everything squared away? It's really variable. Um, you know, for simple bugs, they can get fixed in a matter of minutes to hours. Um, I know that I think the fastest bug uh, we ever saw went, I believe, 16 minutes from report to fix to paid. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's really fast. That's um, amazing. Yeah. What's, what's more typical is we see something on the order of a week or more, um, right? You know, a lot of the problem is uh, the decentralization itself is, uh, is a barrier towards quickly fixing these bugs, right? Uh, if there's a bug in a protocol and the protocol is not upgradable, um, you have a problem of how do I get the funds out of the protocol into the fixed version of the protocol before Black Hat's notice, right? Because Black Hat's would do run generalized front running bots and they'll run your hack before you can do it. Uh -huh. um, if you've read the um, the famous Ethereum is a dark forest paper by Sam CZ Sun. I have not, but I definitely need to jump into a lot of these more topics because it's one of the biggest concepts in DeFi now, like with all the security breaches and it's not gonna go away. It's just gonna, it's, perpetual people are going to keep kind of writing better contracts um, and it's going to take some time till we get to the point where you can 100 percent trust contracts so i i appreciate this insight um and i want to jump a little bit more into the specific priority one bounty if you're familiar with it to my understanding there's a few stages to the event um can you potentially outline how these stay or how just the event will work out 
Uh, I apologize. I am the wrong person to ask about that. I'm, I'm on the, uh, the technical side of the org. If you want to ask me about what bugs we're looking at, I'm your guy. Um, on the, unfortunately, on the business side, uh, that would be a question for one of my colleagues. Um, yeah. If you have that information, please hit me with it. Perfect. I do not have the information. I know it's somewhere on our website in an article we've covered it. So we can just glaze over that one. That information is readily available. Um, you can find it on BSC News or even just directly on the Binance Smart Chain. Um, how do you guys, I mean, we kind of touched on this one a little bit as well, but was it hard in the beginning to find how much you guys needed to incentivize black hats to turn them into white hats? How was this sort of process in 10% come up? Was it arbitrary or was there some sort of studies in the past? Um, and obviously now it's sort of just seemed like you guys have the concrete proof behind it. It's a, it's a lot of listening. Um, you know, we are really well plugged into the DeFi security community. And, you know, because that community is pseudonymous and decentralized, you get a mix of black hats and white hats. And so it was a matter of asking, you know, if somebody offered you 10% to walk away from the bug, would you take it? You know, what if we offered you 5%? What if we offered you 25%? Um, and by collecting that data, we settled on 10%. And 10% isn't really the, the magic number, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty much the lowest you could start offering before black hats take notice. Um, you know, if you really want the, the dedicated black hats, the guys who... Um, you know, this is their day job in and out. Um, you know, they're re these are the guys who are, you know, r raking in, you know, $10 million hacks every month. You need to offer them a lot more than 10%, right? Definitely. Uh, of course. And you also see, you know, big hacking operations like, like the Venezuelan army or like Lazarus group out of North Korea, pretty much no amount of money you could offer those guys will get them to not hack you because they don't care about the law. They are the law. <laughs> um, so you, it really is a scale, but 10% is the pretty much the minimum we found that you need to offer before people start taking notice. That makes sense. And it's proven to be efficient. So it's cool that you guys are looking into these and really trying to figure out how to maximize these bug bounties. How crucial of a role do you think these bug bounties have played since they came up? I mean, you obviously see all of these um, exploits and bugs you guys are fixing. Is it is there a significant amount of submissions you guys get? Yeah, uh, submission volume is pretty high. I would say that um, we see every major vulnerability category every week. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, reentrancy, not handling transfer fee tokens, um, you know, bad permissioning, uninitialized proxies, pretty much everything we see every week. Um, as far as, you know, the volume of user funds that we save every week, um, pretty sure it's over 100 million. Um, uh, sorry, let's take it back. It's, pro it's probably pushing 100 million. It's probably not over 100 million quite yet. Um, you know, since Immunify was launched uh, back in December of last year, you know, we've saved well over a billion dollars uh, in user funds. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure our website has the uh, exact number. At least, at least the number that we are allowed to disclose yet, um, <laughs> because uh, we have a bunch of bugs that uh, we fixed, but we're still working on exactly how to disclose that the bug was found. Makes sense. And you know, every every one of those dollars is something that a black hat would have taken uh, had and Unify not tilted the scales on the economics of uh, vulnerabilities in DeFi. Definitely. And then I have just uh, another couple of small questions to wrap these things up. And you might not be the perfect person for this, but does Immunify plan on adding any of their own maybe funds or spin to bug bounties through potentially like a future token? Or is this something where... Immunify wants to stay strictly to providing the service and just working with the projects and having them put up the bug bounties. So it's a it's a tricky thing to get right um, because right when you launch a DeFi protocol, a DeFi token, right, all of that information is on chain, and the value of bug bounties is precisely that it's not publicly available, right? 
Um, but that said, we are launching a bug bounty protocol and a bug bounty token soon. Uh, so please stay tuned to that. We are we are very much eating our own dog food here. Uh, we are undergoing, I believe, four audits um, before we open source the code and let the community take a look at it. And then once we've done that, then we're going to launch because we need we absolutely need to make sure that the protocol is secure. Yeah, that's great to hear. I'm not sure if you ended up finding that number there, but we can go ahead and wrap this up. I really appreciate you joining us today. And I think it's incredible the gap that Immunify has bridged on all of DeFi, not just Binance Smart Chain. And I think the Priority One program is incredibly notable and cites the focus that is on security on in the Binance Smart Chain, that the ecosystem is willing to rally behind these things and put up a bug money to help out projects that may not necessarily have all the funds. Yeah, and we are working with projects of all sizes to make sure that we get a bug bounty solution that's sized right for them. Uh, and there are lots of different ways that projects can fund their bug bounty programs. So even if uh, you're a project that's just starting out that you know has launched last week, that's not to say that you can't have a bug bounty program. Please get in touch with us, uh, check out our website, and we'll make sure that we tailor the bug bounty program that works for you and that tells your community that you take security seriously. Perfect. Thank you so much, Duncan. I appreciate you joining us and I look forward to speaking with you in the future, man. Peace out. Awesome. So we're now halfway through the event where you have a couple projects left. We have Hackin, Pancake Bunny and Onto Wallet, but we're gonna take a short break to do an NFT giveaway. And this is actually in partnership with Featured by Binance, the decentralized NFT marketplace um, by Binance. And so we have a 40 NFT giveaway. There's going to be a QR code pictured on screen. And all you'll have to do is scan the QR code. It's gonna take you to a giveaway form. Once you complete all those actions on that form, you will then be eligible to win the NFTs, which we'll announce. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long the event runs for. It'll be on the form there. It'll say when it closes. And once that form closes, we'll be able to select the winners for the NFTs. Um, so there'll be 20 bronze NFTs, 15 silver and five gold. So 40 winners in total. And this is on top of the other giveaway we're doing uh, through the event for $2,500, which is also another giveaway form um, that has been attached to all of our tweets. So be sure to enter those. Maybe you get lucky, win some NFTs or even just some BNB. Um, and thank you again to Featured by Binance for putting together the artwork for these NFTs and allowing us to give them away during this event. And with that said, we can jump into our next guest. And our next guest is a cybersecurity consulting firm, and they've been in the space since 2017. They've provided services to some leading uh, entities in the space, such as OneInch, FTX, and CoinGecko. I'm referring to Hackin, and their essential focus is blockchain security. To ensure they're providing a secure experience to DeFi, they provide auditing services, penetration tests, and security assessments. Today, I have Dima, the CEO of Hackin, who will be joining us to touch on the damage of front running bots. And this is truly a unique topic. How's it going, Dima? Hey, hey everything's cool. Um, enjoying the evening, a lot of work, um, but what to do? Uh, everything is hot. Everything is needed to be done immediately. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but we enjoy the, we enjoy such, um, uh, such moves so yeah everything is good it's definitely more fun than those few days few weeks that we were sitting on the 30k support it's definitely easier to get everything done when things are flying high i mean um i'm not uh, like there is a very clear trend that it looks like crypto is winning and so um yeah we, we will definitely have ups and downs but like it's okay you know definitely uh, it's a lifetime story, so we're here <laughs> for, for very long, and we don't care about like short slippages into the like 30k. Oh my god, it is so small. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 
Perfect. You can go ahead and share your screen sure. and then we can jump into your presentation because sure. this one is something that I think is incredibly beneficial for just the average user. Sure. Uh, so I wanted to say that um, we, we actually also do have a bug bounty, but we are specializing more on the uh, penetration tests and on the exchanges uh, bug bounties. And um, like we, we work almost with all the big uh, bug bounty, uh, uh, with all the big exchanges. And if you are a bug bounty hunter, if you want smart contract uh, hacking, yeah, you can go to Min5. But if you are exchange bug bounty uh, um, uh, hunter, uh, you should go to us, Hacking Proof. All right, so uh, the topic today that I wanted to, to speak on is about front running bots. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, explain uh, how they work and uh, to highlight that uh, history repeats. Uh, back in uh, uh, tens, when just when the the uh, uh, when the daily trading, the stock trading appeared, uh, there was a, a very similar concept to current front running was called um, uh, Flash Boys. That was the period when um, a big brokerage companies were installing their servers uh, as close as possible to um, exchanges and NASDAQ in order to be first to intercept the bid orders and to play against those bid orders. So basically buy first and then put the uh, buyer who is slower into the sandwich. So uh, there is an amazing book to read, uh, Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. Um, like if you are fond of crypto and trading, you, you should definitely go and check it out. Uh, but yeah, coming back to front running bots, um, what is it? Is um, the problem uh, that is currently uh, heavily uh, uh, looked uh, heavily uh, spread across Binance Smart Chain, Pancake Swap, and uh, Uniswap. Uh, so these are arbitrage profits, and they damage uh, ethical, maybe not ethical investors' trading experience. They have great, great price uh, impacts, and uh, there is still a big lack of anti-bot solutions. So, um, what is the front run? Probably if you use the DEX tools, uh, time after time, you can see that uh, there are some, okay, there are some uh, interesting uh, icons on the right with the, uh, with uh, small heads, okay. Uh, with the small heads of uh, indication of the front run, uh, just like this. So uh, this means uh, that uh, the attacker saw uh, that there is going to be a big buy of uh, the asset at the trading pair. And he used some technique to place a buy order before this order and then he is when the order of this buyer is executed he immediately sells into his own order so by doing that he usually is taking the profit from uh this sale approximately depending on the um on the uh size of the bot or of the order approximately five percent so uh, by doing this, he basically eats the liquidity and he does not allow the uh, price go up from this uh, trading uh, uh, buy order. Uh, so this is massively uh, spread in uh, Uniswap and uh, uh, probably it's not a secret to a lot of people, but maybe it will be a news to uh, uh, listeners, um, there is a rumor that uh, front running bots are run by uh, mining pools. 
because uh, mining pools have uh, unique knowledge how they can uh, of uh, orders that are uh, sent to uh, decentralized exchanges and only this uh, uh, and this uh, mining pools theoretically and practically uh, they can uh, order these orders in the way they want them to be uh, we know for sure uh, that these cases were happening um, using the um, unfair launches when um, new trading pairs were established and we know for sure that this is happening with the uh, current uh, uh, trading as well um, just to jump in real quick on binance smart chain it's proof of stake authority so it's a little different how they're doing these sandwich attacks or is it still somewhat <clears throat> similar so yeah, so right now, uh, thanks for question. So uh, right now, this is, uh, you know, the, uh, right now we are, we can answer only the uh, game theory. And let's, uh, let's discuss this topic. So in Ethereum, we know for sure that uh, mining pools are unethical. We know it. Uh, in Binance Smart Chain, and especially in Pancake Swap, uh, we see lots of uh, front running bots. So if there is a front runner bot, it means that someone can see the um, can see the uh, trade before it's executed. So who are these two uh, uh, parties who theoretically can do it? It would be the validator. I know that, right? Like, okay, validators is only like five, uh, yeah. uh, how many, like 21, whatever. We don't know the number. We don't, it's not very uh, publicly available information. Theoretically, also PancakeSwap can see it. We, we don't know the answers. We only see the results uh, of unfair trading when tokens that are traded at BSC, decentralized exchange, are suffering from front runner attacks and um, these are numbers uh, from our research that around five percent of daily trading volume are intercepted by bots uh, that one bot one transaction every three minutes uh, and in average 10 bots are detected since launch of every pair so uh, this is a very serious question and uh, I want to raise attention of including parties involved here that, uh, guys, uh, sooner or later, uh, people will scream about it. The same as it was with Flash Boys. Everything was uh, gone under big investigations, and this is something that needs to be fixed SAP. So uh, what about the solutions? Uh, if we speak about um, the uh, traditional stock market, what they did, they created basically the decentral decentralized exchange that was setting the uh, connections with every single broker at very fixed, limited uh, 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 timeline. So, it doesn't matter how far or how close is the broker. You were, uh, uh, you had the road to connect only like one second, let's say, uh, in average. It slowed down the trading experience, but it created the fair rules to everybody. That was very big, unique solution. Um, from our point of view, um, there are uh, like there are a lot of theoretical. Uh, solutions how to fight with the front runner bots. A lot of them are manual, um, uh, just like, for example, uh, our solution, Worminator, which uh, continuously create the database of front runners. And uh, when this uh, anti front runner solution is implemented, it just blocks the uh, uh, request from such accounts. 
but this is uh, you know this is manual solution the automatic solution would be uh, that uh, the new version of pancake swap or i don't know uh, a new dex more pop uh, like uh, that will have a similar size of liquidity that it is very precise to the orders that are sent to exchange and uh, they are eliminating the, any possibility of front runner it can be uh, for example one uh, order per block or uh, it can have some other uh, in smart contract uh, methods to eliminate a big uh, uh, big sandwich uh, buy and sell walls. Uh, there is a lot of uh, information and I can share uh, on the theoretical solutions. Uh, but from the user experience, uh, what I can say is that uh, please uh, be very careful with the slippage uh, tolerance that you are setting. Uh, the bigger slipper, slippage tolerance you put, the more chances that you will, uh, that your liquidity, your buy order will be eaten by a front runner bot. So, so this is uh, what I wanted to speak today. Um, yeah. yeah, very, for... very straight, very straight uh, point is that guys, this is a problem and this problem needs to be solved and who needs to solve it either pancake swap or bsc validators perfect yeah and this is something that i learned about a few months back and it's something that a lot of users probably don't even know um, that it's really happening and i realized it when i started using tools like dex guru that actually showed me the order flow um and it's super easy to get stuck with your slippage um, on a high setting because there's all these deflationary tokens and tokens with taxes that require anywhere from 5 to 15% slippage. So if any users are leaving the slippage high, it's a perfect opportunity for these front runners to come in and arbitrage nearly five, uh, on average, it sounds like 5% from your trades. And it's really just as simple as I mean, the manual solution for the time being is just making sure that your slippage is set to the minimum amount. Um, it's never a bad idea to try to have less slippage and slowly adjust till your transaction goes through. And that way you're ensuring that even if you are getting front run, you're giving a, a very little piece out of your trade. Um, I wanted to jump into a few questions, Dima, and you guys conducted that case study on DXCT. Yep. This was a somewhat smaller token. These front running bots are being um, ran all across the Binance smart chain, correct? Like mm -hmm. hundreds of yep. pairs. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, yes. and so let, let me show it live, uh, just yeah. how it looks like. So this is the Dex tools. Um, I think you might need to share your screen again and then we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So I'm at Dex Tools right now. It's a live pair. So today's trading. Uh, so here we go. So uh, it's a, a it's not a very big token. So the uh, buy uh, uh, the buy order for 3.97 uh, BNB uh, resulted into um, a sandwich. So it's immediately. Uh, was uh, buy order for 6.92 and the sell wall for 6.93. Not a very big profit uh, for the uh, for uh, the the, uh, the sniper uh, for the front runner bot, but it resulted that the price didn't go up. It actually went down after the buy order for a relatively big amount of. Uh, uh, for the uh, buy order. So imagine, uh, imagine what happened. Uh, so guys, uh, so the token was bought by a new investor and the price went down. What the fuck? Sorry for my French. <laughs> no, and it's a great point because a lot of people probably aren't seeing these things go down. 
And on the specific pair that you guys did this the case study, DXCT, there is yep. almost 20,000 extracted daily, I think I saw in the slide. Does Hacken have any sort of estimate on how big this is going or how big this is across the chain? Is this- Yeah, so across the chain, we our approximation uh, is uh, that per day, daily, it's around $10 million. Uh, and this is only what we, what Dex tools identify. And we don't even see uh, all the uh, mess and all the dirt that uh, Dex tools don't identify because we are relying on their data. So uh, our research resulted to 10 million USD, USDT equivalent a day. So per, uh, so per month is more than 300 million. Incredible. That's, what, what, <laughs> what? 300 million per month? You see? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you kind of mentioned some of these anti front running bot solutions at the end of the pre uh, presentation. One of them, the most obvious, is slippage. Um, you guys have another product, Worminator. Is this something that can potentially help safeguard users? If not, what is the purpose of Worminator? Yeah. So, um, it's working in the way that uh, it's uh, uh, it's a code uh, which is uh, answered when the liquidity pair is created. So this code is uh, listening to uh, Worminator database and it blocks the uh, work of the blacklisted front runners. So the database of the uh, Worminator is continuously uh, getting bigger and bigger. So uh, of course uh, it's uh, it's a solution that uh, requires a lot of uh, efforts, but it blocks in our uh, uh, in our estimation ninety five percent of front runners, which I think is a good result. Uh, our idea is that uh, our vision that soon there will be a dex with absolutely different approach to anti front run solutions. And over there, we will also take part. Perfect. And is the Worminator something users can utilize now, or is it still being developed by hacking? Yeah, well, right now, the, yes. Uh, but uh, Worminator right now is B two B solution. Okay. So uh, new, uh, like existing tokens or existing uh, uh, or new tokens that are uh, that want to have a fair launch, uh, these are clients of Worminator. Perfect. That's so this one, so Worminator more specifically protects against sniping bots on listing. Sniper and... bots is a little bit other story, but yes, fair okay. launch is the same thing is a little bit different, but uh, let's say like this, the, the bad actors are the same for sniping bots and for, for front runner bots. Perfect. Makes sense. And then kind of just to circle back to hack in a little bit. What is the goal of the Hacken token and how does it promote growth and security across um, DeFi ecosystems? Sure. So um, Hacken is, Hacken token is um, the, our main uh, point of, uh, that shows the growth of uh, Hacken foundation. So all our activities are built around Hacking Token. Hacking Token can be named as our um, equity share in the sense that we are not selling any equity. We are not fundraising into, uh, into shares. Uh, if investor is coming to us, we are saying go and buy our token. Uh, Hacking Token utility uh, is that they it allows users to participate in uh, projects that are launched by Hacking Foundation, as well as farming the, these tokens projects. So currently we have three projects to come in next month and users can farm with Hacking Token by just taking in our app and experiencing 30, 40% yield per year. Perfect. If and we our, say, if we talk about the uh, the B two B business, we are creating 
uh, from our profits that we generate and revenues, we are creating the uh, fund reserve that supports the price. So uh, if the client wants to pay uh, for our services in Hacking Token, he can do it and he will receive 30% discount. Perfect. That makes sense. That's a unique utilization there. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, the real utility uh, will come uh, further down the line. We, uh, uh, we see the growth of Hacking as, um, as the DAO and uh, we will have uh, quite a few decentralized uh, applications that will utilize um, hacking in a bit other sense. Okay. That's Another, uh, and, and we have uh, also B2C applications such as VPN password managers that are free uh, to use for our uh, token holders. Perfect. And is that actually live currently, the um, free to use VPN? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Hacking uh, has around nine to 10 projects. We are since 2017. We are, uh, we, we are quite a strong company with a lot of plans. Yeah, that was great, Dima. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thank um, you for inviting yeah, this was definitely something that needed to be addressed. And I know a lot of users may have not known about the front running going on, especially if they're just trading on the front end interface of PancakeSwap and not really seeing how these orders are going through. So I think this was one of the most important presentations. Um, thank you. And I think there's definitely a lot to take away from it. Thanks. Yep. Thank Thanks. you so much, Dima. All right. Until next time. Sweet. All right, we're getting down to the end of the wire here. Our next protocol is a team that has unfortunately dealt with multiple exploits. And for this particular reason, we've had we've decided to have them on for the security summit because in their past couple months of developments, they've completely overhauled their development process and kind of restructured what they think about security. And the project I'm referring to is Pancake Bunny and it, after a result of multiple exploits, they've, sh they've shifted completely towards promoting a security regime. The protocol has taken a large effort to learn from its mistakes and its parent company, Mound Limited, is looking to slow developments and vertically integrate to prevent exploits. Today, John from uh, the business development lead at Mound Limited is going to join us to outline what they've learned from the recent flash loan exploits and how they plan to move forward. How's it going, John? Good, how are you? I am not too bad. Getting down to this end of this jam-packed event, and there's been a ton <laughs> of information shared. Um, you can go ahead and share your screen and jump into the presentation. And then sure. I'd like to start it off with a quick kind of introduction on what Mound is and how it plays a role into the, or how Pancake Bunny plays a role into the Mound ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. Perfect. So you should just be able on the bottom there, uh -huh. there'll be a little share icon. Are you able to see my screen now? Um, no, it does not look like it's came up. There should be a little bar at the bottom of the page, mute, stop camera, share. Yeah. Um, share. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. No worries. We'll be able to get this sorted out. Let me see if I can't get this open for you, and then I should be able to just share my screen. I just want to okay, get it yeah. in a proper document here. Let's see. Okay, here we go. You got it? Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, no yeah, I, can, I guess uh, we can start off with an uh, introduction. You know, you've already sort of introduced myself, but I'm John. I'm the um, uh, lead uh, business development person for Mound and for Pancake Bunny. Uh, I've been with the project ever since Pancake Bunny launched. 
um, and that's back in November of uh, last year. And essentially, a, a brief introduction into Pancake Bunny. Uh, we are a decentralized finance DeFi yield aggregator and optimizer for uh, BSC. Uh, so we are uh, still one of the largest yield aggregators across uh, ETH and BSC in terms of TVL. And sort of the primary goal of our platform is to support the DeFi ecosystem uh, and to provide users uh, easy way to um, increase their profit profitability across a, a variety of different chains. Um, and the team has a central mission of lowering the barrier of entry to DeFi uh, while also prioritizing safety and security. Um, and so Pancake Bunny is essentially created by Mound. And you can think of Mound as a blockchain company, a parent company. Um, and under Mound, we have a variety of different projects that uh, I would be sharing uh, details with uh, throughout the presentation as well. Perfect. We can probably jump in here into your guys' security checklist slide. Yep, for sure. Uh, and so, you know, I, I made the presentation sort of concise on pur purpose, and then I'll be sort of sharing the details here. So in terms of post-mortem and security sort of uh, checklist, um, as a project that has been through two exploits, one on BSC and one on Polygon, um, we thought it would be good to share our insights in terms of both the past and the present. Um, and so the first checklist we have is providing a detailed post-mortem report following an exploit and an, and an attack. And so in our view, um, post-mortem reports should ideally come out within 24 hours of an exploit. Um, and it should include every single detail of the exploit from start to finish, uh, what sort of vulnerabilities there were. Um, and also we recommend including a call to action, uh, both for enhanced security as well as compensating users that were affected by uh, the exploit. So that's exactly what we did with uh, both of our exploits. Um, after that happened, essentially our team was, you know, bunkering down and having, you know, video calls throughout the night in order to um, craft a detailed postmortem, but that also had sort of future plans uh, to mitigate the same issue, um, as well as provide users uh, compensation uh, in order to sort of relieve their uh, losses, if you will. Um, and so the second sort of uh, checklist that we have is a structured dev schedule. Um, so before our exploits, our team had a very aggressive timeline in terms of development. And the main priority was to push out these innovative products as fast as possible and to get it out there in the market. Um, but obviously, after our experiences, after dealing with two of our exploits, we have realized that you know security should always be prioritized above everything else. And so uh, the checklist item that we added was uh, alpha plus beta dev schedule. Uh, and this essentially uh, what it is is you know after the devs finalize their code, uh, they allow for an extended period of internal, and that's alpha review. And so through this alpha review, a lot of the devs, you know, be it devs that are um, working on the specific project or devs that are working on other projects, they essentially come together um, and to test out their code. Uh, and so that's the alpha phase. And, you know, after that's done, we have another iteration in the beta phase. And that's a chance for our, um, you know, business ops and our marketing and, and all of our other teammates to essentially try out the platform, you know, and from a user experience perspective and just from a flow perspective, you know, does it make sense? Is there any issues, uh, be it in the UI or be it in the smart contracts? And so that's the beta uh, phase that we have. And after sort of numerous iterations, um, you know, we're able to give feedback and further strengthen the security before uh, the launch actually happens. Um, and finally, the third sort of checklist that we have is a testnet launch. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, obviously, you know, as, as you guys know, there's the main net and, and the test net. And so for us, we have actually decided that prior to launching a new platform, uh, such as Qubit, so Qubit is our new lending platform, but our team um, has actually launched a test net. And uh, the purpose of the test net is twofold. So one is for the community and the users to gain familiarity with the platform before the main net launch. Um, whether it's specifics in terms of the UI UX, in terms of okay, how do I, you know, um, use this website? You know, how do I go from you know collateral um, and, and figuring that stuff out? Um, and the second sort of purpose is for the preliminary audit to be complete, 
um, in order to fix any issues before mainnet. And this also goes in hand with any bug bounty programs that may be launched during the testnet phase that we've already done. Um, and so holistically, the testnet really allows extra time for the devs to track any security issues, any bugs uh, that the community, that the audit firm, that the bug bounty programs like ImmuneFi sheds lights on and has more time to deal with the scenario uh, before it goes live. Um, so I think I'm done with that slide. Uh, Perfect. We could go up to the next slide, though. Yeah, and I think what's most notable about this is that you guys have identified an issue and are looking to solve it. And it's not completely out of the blue, right? Like most mm -hmm. bu businesses, it is a rush to get out your minimum viable product, get it out to the community, start getting mm -hmm. feedback. Exactly. Um, and so it made sense why that was the original sort of idea behind Pancake Bunny. But then mm -hmm. we had these issues or the issues of flash loan exploits and it kind of started to seem like, okay, it's much more important to slow down and value security and make sure mm -hmm. that we're not just being reactive, but proactive as well. And that's kind of been a theme throughout the summit. So For sure. even though there has been exploits, like it's inevitable, things are bound to break. Um, mm -hmm. There's bound to be mistakes. I, mm -hmm. I think it's particularly notable that you guys have identified a solution and are working towards it versus a lot of projects that just kind of shut down and disappear after these hacks. So that's definitely exactly uh, a noteworthy point I wanted to touch on. And then I can let you get back to this last slide here. For sure. Um, yeah, in terms of the last slide, um, the main point that I sort of wanted to bring home is that code security has no silver bullet. And what I mean by that is that there really is no single item or single action that can make a project 100% invulnerable to attacks. And so when we look at security from a project pers perspective, um, it really is a culmination of different items and actions that come together to strengthen the entirety of the project. So it isn't just one sided, it's, you know, multi sided uh, with different actors involved as well. Um, and, you know, going through this list again, um, you know, the first thing that I have is continuous cycles of audits. So in our experience, it, re it really is important to uh, have a continuous cycle of audits with various auditing firms. So, so far for us collectively across our projects, we had the pleasure of connecting with HE Labs, uh, with Hexlint, with Theory, uh, Peck Shield, um, and we're on track to get a Certic audit as well. Um, and so we really hope uh, to add to this list of auditing firms as we roll out to different platforms in the future. Um, and I think having a variety of audits uh, not only enhances security, but I think it really does build trust within the community. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you can't really have too many audits because every audit is going to be different because they're done by different people. Um, and, you know, people that people and firms that have different perspectives and whatnot. So I think it really is imperative for projects to take a look at this uh, continuous cycle of audits, especially after their platform has been updated, uh, whether it's updating code or updating UI, UX and whatnot. Um, so that's that. And the, the next item that I have is aggressive bug bounty programs. Um, so I think that bug bounty programs are really as effective as audits, uh, particularly because having a well-established bug bounty program means an ongoing perpetual cycle of code review through these third-party white hats, right? And so when you think of audits, especially audits before launch, it's really a preliminary sort of view in terms of, okay, when you guys launch, you know, what security issues do you have and how can you fix them? Um, but once you've done that, you know, for a period of time, you know, after the, the, the project is launched, um, there really is no sort of um, live service, if you will, or live sort of actions taking place with people reviewing code other than our internal devs, of course. Um, and so we've actually partnered with ImmuneFi. I know um, I've heard uh, the ImmuneFi uh, team speak uh, previously, and um, we've partnered with ImmuneFi on this front. So there are, they are our main sort of bug bounty partner. And we've been very active with the bug bounty rollouts. Um, and so now we have Pancake Bunny, we have Poly Bunny, we have Qubit listed on uh, ImmuneFi, and we have been actively giving out uh, bounties and we plan to do so in the future as well. 
Um, and I think it's also important to note that, you know, when creating a project, it's uh, also very useful to have a sizable portion of your funds reserved for security in order to guarantee the funds for audits and for bug bounty programs and whatnot. And so this is sort of another thing that we um, uh, grew from our, our mistakes as well in terms of for, for Pancake Bunny, um, you know, we really didn't have a set allocation or a budget uh, specifically for security. And so when we were launching Qubit, um, our team sort of discussed internally and said, you know, hey, security is very important and it's a top priority to us. You know, why don't we allocate a significant chunk um, to security? And we've exactly done that. Uh, we've, um, you know, committed 3% of our entire QBT tokens into just security. So that 3% will be going towards auditing firms, will be going towards immune fine but bounty programs and whatnot. So I think that's also another uh, important thing to add there. Um, and finally, the last thing is sort of reactive and proactive solutions. Um, and, you know, this this whole summit, you know, we've had um, wallets, we've had, you know, ImmuneFi and Hacken and other, you know, security sort of detailed uh, firms talk to us. And I think the DeFi space is really full of proactive solutions from bug bounty programs and audits, but I think it does lack reactive ones. Um, and, you know, although insurance platforms exist, um, it really is effectively impossible to insure our entire TVL. So our, our TVL is, you know, almost $800 million. And it's, it really is hard to insure $800 million in, in the world of DeFi. Um, and so essentially, after our exploits, um, our team was able to push out an extensive sort of reactionary action plan um, that provided insight into compensation for those affected. And at first, we created a new pool we called uh, the P Bunny Pool. And that essentially provided streams of income, uh, not only from our regular pools, but also from the team's share of fees. So we essentially, after our first exploit, we forfeited any profit that the team would take. And we gave that profit to compensate the users uh, that were affected by the exploit. And although we were able to compensate over 18.3 million into this compensation pool, we really did want to think outside the box in order to not only add value, but also restore the community's trust. And so we came up with this idea of MND swap and the MND vault. And essentially what that is, is you can think of MND vault as a vault that accrues value over the entirety of our platforms. So Pancake Bunny, Polygon, uh, Polybunny, and Qubit, and all of our future projects, um, their tokens or a share of their tokens will be inputted inside the MND vault. And so through this swap, um, bunny holders were able to swap their bunny into MND. And by doing that, we were able to reduce the circulating supply of bunny by over 3 million tokens. Um, and essentially, I know uh, with the first uh, flash loan attack that happened, um, there was an excess of millions and millions of tokens, bunny tokens that were printed and then dumped uh, via the flash loan. And so, you know, we reacted to that by innovating and by coming up to this. And I think we're really proud of the progress that we've made um, in terms of cutting back supply um, as well as adding value. Um, but yeah, that's ex uh, essentially what I have for uh, the slides right now. So I just want to thank you again for having me here. Yeah, perfect. And we'll be able to jump into some discussion here. And I think it's really notable. We didn't touch on too many reactive solutions, but mm -hmm. I was very quick throughout the summit to mention that hacks are bound to happen. They're, exactly. they're unavoidable. So exactly. being reactive is important. Making sure that the community is able to recoup these losses is something mm -hmm. that is actually extremely crucial. For and sure. obviously you want to avoid hacks at all costs, but mm -hmm. being in the DeFi space, we know that it's just something that is unavoidable. So mm -hmm. I do think it is pretty notable. Um, and not to put you exactly on the spot where the rewards you guys sort of accumulated for this reaction, how close were they to covering a majority of the funds that were lost through the exploit? For sure. So I would say that uh, the 18.3 million, that was still a sizable chunk, uh, but it still sort of paled in comparison to uh, the actual funds that were lost. And then through the MND swap, essentially what we did was, uh, so what I explained earlier was P Bunny was this compensation pool. So 
bunny holders that were uh, affected by the exploit were given P bunny, and through P bunny they were able to um, essentially get 18.3 million in rewards. And our team, um, you know, saw that and, and, and said, hey, you know, 18.3 million is still not enough to cover uh, the entirety of the losses. And so that's why we created the MND vault and the MND token, and we committed uh, into sort of giving the P bunny holders that were affected by the exploit a pro rata share of the MND minted. And so they were able to gain a portion, a, a, a sizable portion of the MND uh, that was given out. And of course, MND right now, uh, we do not have a uh, formal liquidity set up, but we are set to do that in the future. And we envision that, you know, once that's set up and once we have ample liquidity and, uh, and a proper staking mechanism, um, we think the uh, the market price will definitely, you know, uh, see and reflect the value in that. Um, and, you know, accounting for that, I would say uh, we definitely have done a very good job in terms of, um, you know, uh, recouping a, a sizable portion of the losses. Yeah. And I think, or what I got from the presentation is that it's fairly notable that you guys are identifying these solutions moving forward and also trying to, as best as you can, kind of reprimand and compensate users that were affected by these things. Mm -hmm. um, just for a little bit more concrete and specific example, mm -hmm. the development of Qubit has definitely seemed like it's undergoing sort of this new develop, slow development process. Mm -hmm. Is it potential, can you potentially shed some light on where the development process is with that lending and borrowing protocol and the idea of vertical integration? Um, for sure. That? Yeah. For sure, I would love to. Um, so in terms of the developer for, for Qubit, uh, we had already launched our test net, um, I believe, a, f a few weeks ago, uh, around three weeks ago. And then throughout that period of the test net, uh, we immediately launched Qubit, the, the test net version on ImmuneFi. Um, and so, and, and also in conjunction with that, we've partnered with PeckShield, uh, one of the notable auditing firms for the Qubit audit. And so in terms of the, the development, um, we've already received and you know published the audit from PeckShield, uh, and you know some some changes were made uh, in order to strengthen security, obviously. And so we're at a point where the devs do feel uh, pretty comfortable because we have an audit, uh, we know you know what to change, and we've had a lengthy period of a test net where both the developers um, and the ops team and the community um, has given feedback, extensive feedback to the developers. Um, and essentially over the past three weeks and into the next week as well. So for a period of one month, the developers have been able to essentially uh, iterate and take feedback and to you know, build the platform better. And so we are actually launching on the 24th of August. So that is our mainnet launch date. And I would say uh, the devs are, are pretty hopeful uh, right now. So it looks good. Perfect, that's nice to hear. And it's cool to see you guys incorporate these um, new things you've learned after the exploits and kind mm -hmm. of just to jump back a little bit to reactive mm -hmm. solutions. What was sort of the hardest thing moving forward from the exploit and how was the team able to rally together and come to a conclusion? Or For, a sure. For sure. So I would say the hardest thing was definitely reputation and image. Um, I think being attacked twice definitely, you know, takes a hit on your image and your reputation. Um, but, you know, our team is, is very motivated. Um, and from the start, we knew that, you know, even if an exploit had happened, we were not giving up uh, in the end, end period. And, um, you know, as you mentioned before, there are many, many projects that after they suffered a sort of uh, debilitating attack, essentially, they just shut down and they're not able to operate. Um, but we really sort of stuck our heads together. We spent, you know, 12 plus hours creating a detailed compensation plan, but also creating um, and testing out multiple different scenarios in terms of, okay, what, which specific reactionary plan would work best for the ecosystem. And we really did think about everything. We thought about, uh, you know, creating a new bunny token, creating a new page and whatnot. Um, and, you know, we had to consider everything from ample liquidity to, you know, the bunny price to compensation and the future and, and security measures and whatnot. So. Um, I think um, in terms of moving forward from the exploit, what the team really did well was uh, one, 
um, taking the necessary measures to have a structured dev schedule and continuous audits and bug bounty programs, but also to sort of looking past that exploit and to continue to innovate um, and add value for compensation, um, whether it's the Peabody compensation pool or the MND, so that users feel more comfortable and um, you know feel like you know they've at least re uh, recovered some of their lost funds. And so they can continue using our platform. Yeah, and obviously community faith is one of the largest things that exploits affects. Um, obviously, there's still going to be community members that are upset and mm -hmm. with the loss of funds. Is there any sort of reinsurance or further compensation? Maybe outline on the MND vault. I know you were touching on that. Is there any or other compensation or innovation that the team plans to bring out? on top of that? For sure. So um, talking about compensation, I guess one other thing to highlight is that compensation is tricky as well because the team um, really had to think about balancing uh, supply, uh, the bunny price, uh, the future of the ecosystem, as well as compensation. Because when we're talking about compensation, we're essentially um, giving out or minting tokens um, out of thin air um, mm -hmm. and, and giving it to users, which means that the supply will definitely increase, right? And so because of the exploit and because the supply drastically increased and the price essentially plummeted, um, we had to figure out a way to balance reducing supply drastically and bringing the bunny price up while at the same time providing an extensive amount of compensation. And so what our team sort of realized is that, you know, after Peabody um, with the 18, 0.3 million, that obviously wasn't enough. So we came up with the MND vault. And so we sort of concluded that MND would sort of be the last sort of uh, round of compensation for uh, the Pancake Bunny um, exploit um, users that were affected. Um, and uh, our reasoning behind that was, again, um, the balance of supply and the balance of, uh, okay, how much should we compensate and how much should we sort of aggressively push to reduce the supply and to get the ecosystem back and running like it was before the exploit, right? And so that's sort of uh, what, what, what the team has, has thought about. Yeah, that's definitely a tricky subject. It's mm -hmm. balancing sort of, it's very similar just for yield farming in general, balancing the tokenomics with the incentive. Exactly. Um, so I think it's commendable that you guys went ahead and you did do this compensation plan and you're furthering it with the MND vault. And at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it kind of just comes down to the compensation just continues as long as Pancake Bunny continues to innovate. And For it sure. sounds like that's something you guys are on track and doing with the launch of Qubit and um, just further developments in the protocol. So it definitely is an ongoing thing. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's horrible that users lost their funds, but mm -hmm. I think it's in, extremely commendable that the Pancake Bunny team or, and the Mount team kind of just didn't close up shop and leave. It takes a lot to sit there in the line of fire and try to think out these things because at the end of the day, money was drained from the ecosystem and you can't just magically make it come back. So there's only exactly. so many things you can do in building to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, it also does make it extremely hard to build moving forward. You guys now have an extreme amount of pressure. so. I'm excited mm -hmm. to see the further developments. And it sounds like you guys are continuing to build out these measures and learn the best way to develop and promote security on the Binance Smart Chain. For sure. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us today, John. Um, I'm sure we'll speak in the future and I'm looking forward to further developments to come out of Mound and Pancake Bunny. For sure, it's been a pleasure speaking here. Uh, thanks for having me, Greg. Of course, until next time. All right, thank you. Perfect. And we're getting down to the end here. So last but not least, our final guest is another wallet provider. I actually saw someone in chat here. Arthur is eager to hear about Onto. So you got what you wish for. And this protocol provides itself as a decentralized cross-chain wallet, and it allows users to manage their digital identity, including their assets and data. Onto Wallet boasts support for over 14 chains, making it a great platform to jump into DeFi. They also have an extremely intuitive mobile app and website that makes a great onboarding for beginner users. 
Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Humpty, the head of community at Ontology. How's it going, Humpty? Looks All like right, you, here uh, we go. There we are. Yep. <laughs> So I've used this app before, so hey, hopefully I'm not going to embarrass myself. There we go. Perfect. There we are. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. How are you doing? Not too bad. Getting down to the end here and be able to grab some lunch and then get on with the day. I've had a great time at this summit. Great. Yeah, no, it's been fun listening to everyone uh, ahead of me, and I'm thankful and grateful for the invitation. Perfect. Yeah. So you can go ahead and share your screen and then we can jump into the presentation and then head into some discussion to wrap things up. All right. Let me know if there you're having is. any um, issues. Can I share a window? Actually, that's a question I didn't ask earlier. Um, I don't think you can. I think you ah. can only do the screen, which is kind of lame. Would you mind sharing the presentation then? Because I yeah. have a bunch of Let stuff me... open. I was just going to share one window. Let me pull it up. You're going to make me go on the fly here. but <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no worries. I already got well, it set up. I just need to. Yeah. Here we are. Nope, that's the wrong thing. Video. Perfect. Okay. It's a wonderful five slides, so it would be a shame <laughs> if you missed it. Let's get this opened up and presenting. There we are. Excellent. All right, great. So uh, once again, thank you so much, BSC News, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. I've had a wonderful time listening to what everyone else has been sharing in terms of what's what they're working on on Binance Smart Chain. So, I'm here today uh, representing Onto, to, well, to talk about Onto. Uh, I'm Humpty, head of community at Ontology. And uh, well, just like the title says right there, Onto is a self-sovereign data wallet that allows you to securely manage your own digital identity, data, and assets. So simply speaking, the wallet, it does more than just simply allowing you to hold digital assets, but it actually leverages the power of decentralized identity to enable the user to be able to create one uh, and then leverage that to create a reputation score and then using that across the DeFi ecosystem. So, you know, currently DeFi is over collateralized. So what Ontology and through Onto that it seeks to do is to enable users to be able to um, un under collateralize these loans, excuse me. So by leveraging your on-chain behavior, such as being a good borrower, um, you are able to then earn better rates and rewards versus the you know, traditional way of doing DeFi, which is over collateralizing. Um, so on the second page here, it really kind of breaks down the two elements that make up Onto. And the first, I think, is something that we're familiar with, and that is it's a decentralized cross-chain digital wallet or crypto wallet. And really all of that, all of what that means is it allows you to be able to hold uh, those digital assets securely, including NFTs. It allows you to perform these cross-chain swaps. And another feature that goes along with that is it allows users to be able to follow the crypto news through the news feed that's built into it and then use the rich DAP ecosystem. Yeah, On I the think, other side. Sorry, What's just that? to jump in, I was going to say BSC News is actually integrated in that news function. So shout out to Ontology for that. That's right. Actually, so I mean, I don't want to I don't want to deviate too much, but you know, I think that Onto on Finance Smart Chain has been a wonderful uh, experience, and I say that because I've had the chance to speak to some other builders on Binance Smart Chain, and they've uh, kind of boasted about the ability to use it uh, and the and kind of the community that comes along with that, right? So, head of community, that's really my focus is to make sure that there's a community of users and a community of developers that are satisfied with that experience. And so I think that the relationship has been synergistic. Definitely. Um, so thank you for that too. And that includes BSC News. Um, so going to that other half of what it comprises Onto is decentralized identity. And so that's a term that may not be familiar to many of us, uh, but you know that's a term that is quickly picking up uh, steam because there's a lot of development, development, excuse me, happening in that space. 
And really, that is a way to empower users and allow them to preserve their privacy through their interactions in the blockchain. And so decentralized identity and the way that Onto utilizes, it is really the simplest way to create that. You create a wallet and you automatically have a decentralized identity created with you, which then, like I mentioned earlier, you can leverage some of the other tools that have built by that have been built by Ontology, such as OScore, to be able to create that uh, decentralized or self-sovereign uh, reputation. And so, you know, Onto being built by Ontology, there's a synergy there already in terms of the technology that is being used on Onto. Ontology is a little bit of background for anybody who may not be familiar, is a project that brings trust into the Web3 ecosystem. And that includes everything from DeFi, DAOs, NFTs, staking, you know, what we are familiar here uh, with here at Binance Smart Chain and on Ontology as well. So uh, the slide that we have up now talks a little bit more about OntID and really what that is. So OntID is Ontology's version of the DID protocol. And so that is a framework that is built on open standards that uses blockchain and cryptographic technology to connect people, data, and services. Um, and so by using OntID within Onto, the user is not only able to securely create that and manage that digital identity, but they're able to also interact with it. And I'll give you some examples and some of the integrations that Ontology is working on now. Um, so with your OntID, imagine being able to sign in using that instead of using a centralized uh, protocol such as OAuth from Facebook or from Google, where as you're signing in with your identity, their identity, they're also harvesting that data, all of the information of your interactions within their platform and other platforms. So you don't have control over that information or how that data is accessed or used or monetized. With OntID, you now have the ability to control that information, not just control the data, but you also can control the way that that's accessed, how you share it to other platforms, how much of that information you wish to share. And then as Ontology, the long-term vision is also providing the users an ability to be able to not just manage it, but potentially even monetize that data as well. So it really is to give the user full control and power over their identity and their data. So it's kind of taking that own your keys, own your crypto to the next level where it's own your identity, own your data, right? So it really is looking to uh, solve some of the challenges that we're seeing today with uh, centralized data and, 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 and data uh, monetization that doesn't serve the user. Uh, if anything, it's a big risk because then users don't really know how that information is being shared. And like they say, uh, there is an institution that probably knows more about you than you know about yourself because they're able to harvest that data and really uh, you know, look at that information in that way. So, um, you know, as Web3, and we can go to the next slide here. Perfect. Um, and yeah, this ID concept is just incredible. Um, and it's pretty unique and it's expansive that Ontology is focusing on this um, and bringing further use case and like a new meaning to decentralize. Oh, skipped it. Yeah. So actually, and so I'll, I'll touch on the fact that Ontology is, uh, or sorry, should I, should I say Onto is supported uh, or supports different blockchains and different dApps, it has like over 100 dApps listed and over a dozen blockchains. But one thing that is relevant to this discussion is Binance Smart Chain. Binance, uh, Ontology is the sole decentralized identity provider for Binance Smart Chain. And so because of that, it has already begun to enable some of this utility to some of the projects that are built on Binance Smart Chain. One of those is Rocky. They're an NFT platform. And so they've leveraged the power of Ontology's DID protocol uh, to be able to verify their creators so that there is a uh, authenticity to the work that is being published instead of someone saying, oh, this is my, my creation, but in reality, they're still in copyright at work and then they're publishing it and monetizing that. So uh, Ontology is proud to be a provider of that technology to Binance Smart Chain and certainly open to integrating that across the entire ecosystem to bring forward this trust and decentralization that uh, DID promises. 
So other interesting metrics here, you know, like it shows up there, there's tens of thousands of active users on this platform that use it across multiple blockchains. Uh, but for me, the most powerful one, because it's definitely the most unique one, is that it has also helped in uh, taking this number of ontids up to almost 1.5 million or over 1.5 million. So I think that's a that's a meaningful metric there because it really, for me, shows how easy it is to create one. You know, does each of these represent an individual? Maybe not, but the fact of the matter is that if it's this simple to create it, a user has that agency to be able to create as many identities as they need to then use in whichever applications they wish to use it. They could have one for strictly for DeFi. They could have one as your most public one, which I personally do. I have one that I like to use and I would like to that have that be my public record down the line where I could say, look at this address. It has all the interactions that I've done that really show that I am a trustworthy human being on the blockchain and that I should be rewarded for being that. So that's about all I have in terms of the presentation. You know, I will say that uh, through the rich ecosystem that Ontology has built uh, and with Onto as well, you know, this is then perfectly positioned to play a pivotal role in that next generation of the web that we are all familiar with and super excited about, I'm sure. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And that presentation was packed with some things and I just wanna take a step back and for me personally, what a huge use case of Aunt ID sounds like, and it might be a little bit far off because it's just such a hard topic to tackle, but it's the idea of under collateralization inside of dApps. What is the goal of this and how far off do you think this is? Because it's definitely something difficult to do. So I would say that we are getting closer by the day. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a target to anything, but the only thing that I can say is that I am part of discussions on a daily basis with builders across multiple blockchains that are developing tools to empower their communities and they're finding that they're reaching a point where they they're really trying to either reward their community members accordingly based on their contributions or their participation or their reputation you know, and they can't because they really can't identify these individuals in a trustless way. You know, some of them are looking at, you know, using their Twitter accounts. Others are using, you know, their an NFT as a placeholder, but an, an NFT is, is transferable. So potentially you could transfer that reputation to someone else. There may be power in that, but in terms of really recognizing individual humans and rewarding them accordingly based on their contributions to the ecosystem to help the growth, the adoption of it, decentralized identity is doing that. And so along with ontology, there's a few other players in the space that are working on developing this technology. And a lot of them are focused on DeFi because of the fact that, like you said, there's a clear need there to create a more accessible and probably better word, equitable uh, you know, platform and protocol for everyone, where it isn't just those that have a ton of wealth that can put up twice an asset to be able to take out a loan. It's really based on your uh, long-term behavior on that protocol. If I've been borrowing small amounts over time and I'm consistently repaying those back, I should be entitled to, in the long term, just like in real life, get that credit score to go up so that I could take bigger loans without necessarily having to over collateralize. Yeah, and I think that's extremely important and that's where the DeFi space needs to be and it's where people are building towards. We really wanna to get towards this idea of under collateralized and having sort of a decentralized credit score on the blockchain so we can get towards these things. And mm -hmm. even to touch on your first point, it a decentralized ID is great for growing a community it allows people to be easily identified while still keeping data protection and ensuring that it's just a great way for the community to participate because not everybody wants to put out their identity to the whole world. So being able to do it in a decentralized manner and be recognized for it is extremely notable, notable in my opinion. 100% I agree with that. And I think two things that I want to take away from that. One of them is the fact that, you know, as DeFi and just crypto in general continues to grow and scale, 
I think these technologies that will help mature that space bring some of these TradFi uh, mechanisms into DeFi, but doing so in a decentralized way is very important. And really, it, it, that's the challenge, right? Is how do we do it where we're not necessarily repeating some of the problems? Because credit in the real world, it's such an obscure mechanism. You don't know how that's composed. You don't know how you can make changes to it, not easily at least. When you're talking about blockchain and decentralization, you're talking about being able to do, so, do things transparently so that anyone can see how they can make changes that benefits them in the long term. The other thing that you're talking about communities, you know, one, one of the conversations that I've recently had is uh, I've been jumping on these Twitter spaces and these NFT whales, you know, who are advising these NFT platforms. One of the challenges that they're seeing is that, and this is a term that I just recently learned, scalpers. So these people that go in and just take up this huge number of NFTs during the minting session and then just do double, triple, quadruple the price through whatever mechanisms that they that they do, then leaving out that community of people that actually cared about the project. So, you know, then what they're looking for is how do we find a way to identify these individuals and kind of lock out these scalpers that really are in it just for the money, but not really to see the technology grow, to see this community grow as well. And so one last thing that I'd like to say based on what you said is in terms of identity, I think it's important to recognize that identity doesn't mean show your face. Identity doesn't mean say that you're Humpty Calderon, right? Yeah. Identity really is being able to trustlessly um, acknowledge or recognize the identity of that particular wallet or digital identity, right? But it's up to you really how much of yourself you bring onto that identity. You could potentially use social verification as a method. So if you have a Twitter account that you've been using for five years, that's proof of work, right? You've put in the work to show that that is who you are. If you, for some reason, need to verify using KYC by attaching to that uh, decentralized identity a government-issued credential like a password, well, then that makes that decentralized identity that much more powerful. But again, that's your choice. You still have agency. Yeah, and I think that's the true power behind it. All those use cases without really having to put yourself at risk, give out mm -hmm. data that you don't necessarily want to give out. And to right. shift gears a little bit and start to wrap things up, um, I downloaded the app and I just had like a couple questions from like a beginner first look standpoint. Um, the first of which being when you download an app, is this automatically register you for an ONT ID or is this something where once you set up a wallet, you have to go in and do that as well? So... Yeah, downloading the app just downloads the app. It doesn't do yeah. anything. Uh, it's just you know an empty app. Um, by creating your wallet, wallet you're yeah. also creating your decentralized identity. And in fact, as soon as you do, you will see that there's a prefix to your wallet uh, that it's like aunt ID colon and then your wallet address. Gotcha. Perfect. And then the other thing, just on the topic of seed phrases, and then we'll get into some D app integration. But on the topic of seed phrases, this is something we were discussing with SafePal. And it's just incredibly important to be storing these in a safe place. Um, and the average user, one of the first things they go to do is one, people don't even write them down, or two, people tend to screenshot them and keep them in a place where they can be easily mm -hmm. accessed by malicious people. Is the on the app something I notice is there were disclaimers and such, but is there any sort of extra mechanisms you guys are thinking of incorporating potentially just to stress how important seed phrases are? So I guess I'll, I'll say a few things to that. And I will agree with you in terms of the, the importance of securing your seed phrases. In fact, when I first started in crypto, I was giving out my private key because I didn't know <laughs> <laughs> that there was a difference between a public key and a private key. And I was like, oh, send me funds here. There's my wallet or my private key instead of my wallet address, right? So there's certainly an educational barrier. And as we're looking to kind of expand and, and, and the adoption uh, of, of cryptocurrencies into 
uh, to, to people that may not be at all familiar with it, it's important to provide them with the right tools and educate them so that they understand that. Um, so in terms of when you first create your wallet, there is a process where it asks you to back up that seed phrase. Yes. Beyond that, there are there is a huge community behind Ontology that supports that educational uh, process. So besides also having documentation, tutorials, walkthroughs on the Onto documents itself, there's also a community that is very active and constantly answering questions. I've seen the same questions being asked over and over, and the community never tires of it because we understand that there are people that are coming in to the ecosystem that are brand new. They don't understand how things are. And so it, it's a tiered education mechanism, right? It's at the app level, at the documentation level, and at the community level. And so those processes are in place to support that. Yeah, and I think that's an amazing question because you can, I mean, an amazing answer because you can throw on a ton more disclaimers on the app, but people are still not gonna listen. And it sounds like Ontology sort of has these layers. Like, look, we're telling you the first time here, you're following our community, we're still telling you, and even before all of that, if people are diving into some of the educational content before they even download the app, it's in there as well. So I think that's just a massive stressor because I've personally lost funds from not keeping a seed phrase and it was just something silly. Like I was using an app. Yeah, I was using an app, uh, a wallet to just transfer funds cross chain. And it was something as simple as I'll probably never use this wallet again. Turns out the wallet bugged while I was using it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to delete the wallet. So hopefully this bug goes away. Yeah, that was a bad idea. So it's just, it's such a simple thing that I know a ton of like beginner crypto investors overlook. And it's even just like screenshotting it is not enough. Just get out a pen and pencil, write it down on something, keep it in a safe place. Don't even keep one, keep two, just in case your paper gets wet or whatever. It's just such an easy, simple thing. And it's it's just like, it's almost a meme around the crypto community. Like, just do it. You're going to have all these funds and you can't write down 12 words. So I just think it's incredibly important to stress. Well, I think it's actually a little bit funny that in such a digital native space that is crypto, that we are dependent on like these analog mm -hmm. mechanisms, right? <laughs> write it down <laughs> in order to protect your crypto. But really, I think one of the major uh, barriers or hurdles for someone to understand when they're coming into the space is accountability. You know, we're used to banks and these institutions controlling everything uh, in terms of our finances, you know, credit carry, credit card companies, credit uh, score companies, uh, you know, the, these banks, these, these, uh, these, uh, what's it called, the, 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 the trading, the, so yeah, all, all these institutions are there, they can support you. But the reason why is because they have everything on the back end, you have nothing. You have yeah. ones and zeros that don't really mean anything. With crypto, those ones and zeros are meaningful because that is the value that you've created. So you need to be accountable for the protection, the security of that. Yeah, and I don't think it can really be better said. I don't have too much here. Um, this was an extremely useful presentation and discussion. I think a lot of users definitely had something to take away from security and the future use of Ont ID. I think that's something extremely exciting that distinguishes Ontology Wallet and it's looking to make a change for the better in crypto and bring services that are more like traditional TradeFi services in a more efficient and decentralized manner. I'm not sure if you have anything else you want to touch on, Humpty, but other than that, I think we're all set. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that part of that education, I've, uh, along with several members of the team, have taken it upon ourselves to go out and do the work. And so we host regular conversations on a weekly basis, and we cover the gamut of platforms. We're on Clubhouse, we're on Twitter Spaces, we're on Discord, we're on Telegram. So find us on any of those platforms. We host regular conversation with builders. We talk about Web3, what they're building, and also the potential integration of decentralized identity across all of these applications. So, you know, if you're interested in learning more about it, it's a it's a hugely complex topic. Um, join us on our social channels. Join us on Telegram, on Discord. We're always happy to help. But certainly participating in these conversations because you'd be privy 
to some discussions with some of the builders that are really revolutionizing the space. Definitely. I appreciate that shout out. And that's definitely a useful resource. All right, Humpty, I really appreciate you making it out, um, closing up this security summit, and I'm sure we'll speak soon in the future. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. And that is it. That is all our guests for the event. And I'll do a short summary about this, just about some of my favorite things. A huge thing that I think didn't have too much light shed on it, especially for beginner users, was the prevention of flashbots. Dima did a great job in kind of even outlining the history of front running and where it comes from in traditional markets and pointing out that crypto is not immune to that. And it's something that is specifically happening. I think one of the statistics they put out is 5% of daily trading volume is taken by front runners and some massive amount of actual dollar amount. And this is money that's being taken directly from users. On top of that, this summit should drive home that smart contracts are inherently risky and it's humans that are putting together these contracts. This means that there's bound to be errors and they're only gonna get better over time. So it's important to proceed with extreme caution. If there's a smart contract that was just deployed to the market, chances are is there's not a lot of eyes that have glossed over the open source code. So it's high risk. And that's not to say that a project that's been around for three to six months doesn't have any vulnerabilities. It definitely has a little bit more time in the market that proves it's secure. But overall, it's something where smart contracts are inherently risky and it's the nature of DeFi, especially being such a young sector. So it's important to know that there is always this risk that there's a critical vulnerability um, that can result in a loss of funds. And then another thing that is more in the control of the user is the use of hardware wallets and storing your seed phrase properly. And this is something that's massive. If you're getting into crypto and have any amount of money that you would be upset losing, and with something like the SafePal S1 wallet, um, that wallet is extremely affordable. So if you have anywhere over 100 to $200 in crypto, there's really no excuse to have these proper security measures, have a hardware wallet, ensure that you have complete access of your funds and make sure that you're storing your seed phrase correctly. Also, just another last little thing is being sure you're not like when you are interacting with riskier contracts that you understand the risk you're taking and you're setting allowances or potentially not using your main wallets. And I think that's some of the main takeaways here. Other than that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to the security summit. It's been a great event. There's tons of information shared. The goal behind this was to kind of keep it short um, for each project, but enough to where they can share crucial information. And I think this event did a great job of that. Be sure to enter both giveaways. Um, we have the NFT giveaway pictured on screen, and we're also running another Gleam campaign through Twitter. So if you look up our Twitter news underscore of BSC, you'll be able to find that Twitter campaign and enter there. And then most importantly, please subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're just getting started with events of this nature. We're going to be holding monthly summits like this covering all sorts of projects in the future. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one project discussions. We've had some notable projects such as Venus, um, Baby Doge, Crypto Blades, and those videos are all available on the YouTube. So be sure to subscribe for that kind of content because there'll be a ton more coming. And again, thank you everybody for joining the Security Summit. Be sure to stay safe out there.